What is the recipe for a growing and thriving church? Um, what does a church have to do uh, to be blessed by God and to grow and to flourish? Well, the answer is on a postcard, if you know that, uh, that answer. But the book of Nehemiah is not a step-by-step, how does a church get blessed by God? And yet, nevertheless, in Nehemiah, we see God blessing his people. We see God allowing his people to grow and to thrive and to work together to be blessed and to do things for his glory. In chapter 2, we're going to see a repeated refrain, the gracious hand of the Lord was upon us, was upon me, upon the people of God. God's hand was on his people to bless them, to build them up, to encourage them. So the question is, well, how do we receive the gracious hand of God? What does that look like for us? And Nehemiah gives us a great example. There are four things that Nehemiah does that are a great example to us in uh, chapter 2. Four things. Uh, First of all, we pray. We pray. Now, last week, we saw Nehemiah hearing the state of Jerusalem, and his instinct was to pray, was to mourn and fast and call out to God, to seek God. He depended upon him in prayer. As he prayed, as he poured himself out before God, God was magnified in his eyes. He was depending on God. And chapter 2 is about four months later. You see in verse 1, it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, uh, when wine was before him, I took the wine in and gave it to the king. So this is a reference to, uh, to that month, which is about springtime. It's April time, 445 BC. Chapter 1 was sort of November, December, 446. So this is about perhaps four months later in the story. In chapter 1, we saw he was praying, seeking the Lord, depending upon the Lord, declaring the praises of God. We saw him confessing his sins before God, remembering the the threats of God, the promises of God. And 1 verse 4 says, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted. It was a prolonged period of calling upon God, of praying to God. A lengthy time. Nehemiah was a man who loved to pray. He loved to seek after God and to depend upon God. In chapter 9, we're going to see Nehemiah pray a very long prayer. I think it's the longest prayer in the Bible. He he spent lengthy time calling upon God. But in chapter 2, it's the opposite of that. Chapter 2, verse 4, the king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. Do you see that? This is what we describe as a sort of an arrow prayer. He's talking to the king, and he thinks, I need to pray. As the king is looking at him, as the king is watching him, he prays silently in his head, an arrow prayer quickly to God. Help me, Lord. That type of thing. And then he has to speak. He has to talk to the king. This is not a lengthy prayer. This is a silent, quick prayer in his head. Help me, Lord. Give me wisdom. And then he speaks and he acts. We need both of those types of prayers, don't we? We need... Longer times, prolonged times where we're seeking after God, specific times where we we set aside to really pray, to really come before God, to pray for many things perhaps, to confess our sins. But we also need times where we have quick arrow prayers throughout the day. The great thing about praying for a longer period of time is you get to pray for lots of things. You get a real sense of sort of communion with God, fellowship with Him, a sense of even dialogue with Him. Perhaps as you're praying for stuff and then The Holy Spirit puts on your heart to pray for other things that you are different to the things you were initially praying for. That happens when you pray for a a prolonged period, when you set aside time. But we also need to pray for arrow prayers, short times, perhaps when we're at work and the pressure is on and you've got to make a decision there and then and you can't just take yourself off into the toilet cubicle and pray for half an hour. You need to make a decision like that. You pray, help me, Lord. Or perhaps you're parenting the children and they're driving you wild. Um, and you're about to discipline them, and you pray, help me, Jesus, to be gracious here. You say it in your head, you just, as you're walking over, help me. Or in your conversation with somebody, and you don't know how to answer, you don't know what to say, and you pray, Father, give me some words. Please help me. 
just short little arrow prayers to God. We need both of those types of prayers. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians says, pray without ceasing. Now, he doesn't mean the only thing you should do in life is be praying and having your personal sort of quiet time. But he is saying all the things that you do, you to be praying about it, constantly seeking him. God is interested not just in the little part that happens in one part of our day, but all of our day. The whole of life is to be lived for God's glory. And therefore, we should be constantly praying, constantly praying arrow prayers, help me, Lord, in our heads. Everything is for his glory. And Nehemiah, I think, models both of those things. Prolonged period of prayer for, for some days, it says, but also quick arrow prayers. Nehemiah prays because he knows that prayer is the means by which God is at work. Um, when we pray, God changes the world. God acts when we pray. Do we believe that? That when we pray, God does things. He changes situations. He changes people. I mean, look at the passage. Uh, end of verse 8, midway through verse 8. Because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. Or verse 18. I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Or verse 20. The God of heaven will give us success. God's hand was on his people. God was blessing his people, being gracious to his people. How? Through the prayers of his people, through Nehemiah praying. Now, last week we said the difference between Nehemiah and Ezra, in Ezra, the emphasis is on the king made an edict and God used that. That's true in Nehemiah, but there's an emphasis in Nehemiah on we prayed for it and God did it through the king. An emphasis on the power of prayer. It wasn't luck. It wasn't fate. It wasn't sort of things falling into place for Nehemiah. It wasn't the universe working together. It was the hand of God, the gracious hand of God. It wasn't earned. It was all of his grace, all of his kindness, all of his mercy, because Nehemiah prayed. And it's the gracious hand of God in turning the heart of a world leader. King Artaxerxes was not a believer. He was a king, and in the ancient world, if you were a king, you were likely to be an absolute dictator, he could do whatever he wanted. And yet God changed his heart. God was at work even in the heart of this unbelieving world leader. God can do anything to anyone at any time, work in any situation. Nothing is beyond his control. He is absolutely sovereign. It's what we call his providence, his care, his providing for his people through all of the circumstances of life. And that really is the basis of our prayer, isn't it? Why pray unless we are confident that God is absolutely in control and is providentially caring for our lives? We don't just pray for our own sakes. It's not just that you know, I pray and I take my mind off the situation that's happening and it's helpful for me to set my mind on something else. That is true. But it's more than just that. We pray to God because God is providentially in control and he, he is at work in the world. He does things when we pray. We pray and God does stuff. It is absolutely vital for us as a church that we really believe that, that we really have that conviction. If we want to see our church thrive, if we want to see our church grow and be built up, we must pray. We must seek God and Nehemiah is a wonderful example of that. What better way to do that than to meet together and to do it with one another? What better way to do that and to meet fortnightly on a Tuesday at 7.30 in this building and to pray, to seek God together? Why not come along to the prayer meeting on Tuesday at 7.30 in the back hall where we'll pray together? You won't be put on the spot. You won't be asked to pray in front of everybody uh, if you don't want to. But we will seek God together, pray together, because when we pray, God is at work. God does things. Prayer must be foundational for us as a church.
The gracious hand of God was on his people because they prayed. So that's the first thing we see, the first uh, example from Nehemiah. We're to pray. The second is we are to act. What happens? He prays to God, this arrow prayer in his head. What does he do then? He acts, doesn't he? He speaks. Verse 5. Then I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He acts. He does something. Nehemiah is taking a risk here. He's asking something from the king. You can see in verse 5, he refers to the king and himself in the third person. There's a sort of respect and honor for the king. If it pleases the king, he says, let your servant go. You know, there's an honor here to the king. Kings weren't like the sort of constitutional monarchs that we have in the West. He's an absolute dictator. If he doesn't want it to happen, it doesn't happen. If he wants you dead, you're dead. If he's in a bad mood that day, tough luck. He's here with the queen. If he's had a row with the queen and he's not particularly predisposed to granting your favor, you're not going to get it. Nehemiah is taking a risk. He's putting his neck on the line, literally, probably here. But he's doing something. He's asking. He's speaking out. He's asking for a leave of absence from his, his job. What if the king wasn't in the mood to do that that day? What if the king didn't really want to let his trusted royal official go for any length of time? To go to another country that might be a rival country for the well-being of this other distant land. What if he doesn't want to do that? It's a risk for Nehemiah. But he knows he has to do something. He knows he has to act. Do you remember back in chapter 1, we said the thing that Nehemiah was about, the thing was the glory of God. That was the thing he was most passionate about. That was the thing he was most zealous for. That was the thing that he was most concerned of. Not himself, not his own reputation. He's concerned with Jerusalem, the promises of God. Jerusalem is in a mess. Nehemiah is not some sort of town planner who wants Jerusalem to get back on its feet economically. He's concerned with the promises of God, God's covenant that he's made, God to be with his people, that Jerusalem will be a place where God's people would praise him and be safe. You can see that in verse 20, a little hint of it in verse 20. Nehemiah is answering his opponents and he says, um, we his servants will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. There is no place for these people who are not worshippers, who are not lovers of God, who oppose the gospel message, who oppose the promises of God. Um, God's place, Jerusalem, is to be where they worship, and a place that's safe for God's people, where no unclean thing would come. He's concerned with the glory of God, even if it means for him taking a risk. We're told as much. The end of verse 2 Nehemiah is very honest when he writes, I was very much afraid. He was afraid in this situation. Wouldn't you be? He was afraid to speak out. What motivates somebody to speak out in that situation when it could really cost them? When it could cost them their life? What motivates somebody when they don't know what's going to happen? Or what motivates somebody to speak out in the workplace when you know what you're going to say is not going to be well received by your colleagues or perhaps your bosses. Perhaps it might even lead to you losing your job. What motivates you to invite your friend along to church or a church event and you're not quite sure how that's going to go? Or what motivates you when somebody asks you tomorrow, what do you get up to on the weekend? And you so desperately want to say church, but you're not sure whether you want to really and whether that's going to be well received when you're perhaps afraid of what the response might be. What motivates you to do that? Well, we take a risk if, first and foremost, we're concerned with the glory of God. If that's the thing that we're concerned of, if that's the thing that we have a passion for, a zeal for, if that's what motivates us, his reputation, his praise, his glory, not really just my own, not my reputation, then in those situations we will be motivated to speak. We will speak out and take a risk and even do hard things when we're afraid because we're concerned with God's reputation. 
Now, we must notice here, Nehemiah prays, he seeks the Lord, and he acts. He doesn't just pray and sort of the Lord will do it. He prays and he knows he has a responsibility to do something. God works in the world. He works through means, through things, through people, often his own people. We're to call on God, pray, seek him, and then we are to act. We are to do stuff. It's famously been said, it's like a sort of parallel train tracks. You can imagine sort of standing on train tracks, these two parallel lines in front of you. God's sovereignty, his control of all things, and human responsibility. We as humans are responsible for our actions. We must always have both of those things. Those two things are never to merge. We don't just want one track. The train is in trouble if it's one track. You need both. If it's just God's sovereignty and no human responsibility, that's a problem. If it's just human responsibility and actually God is not in control at all, that's also a problem. Both of those things have to be true. God being in control of all things, providentially controlling the world, helping us, guiding us, but also we have a responsibility as his people to do things, to act. You can see that here with Nehemiah. Both of those things are true. He calls upon the Lord and then he speaks he acts. He does stuff. If we are to thrive as a church, we must believe absolutely God is in control, but also we have a responsibility to act. We have a responsibility to get stuck in and get involved. Now think about it like this. Uh, we as a church, we exist to make disciples of Jesus. That's what we're about, to glorify God by making disciples of Jesus here in Swindon and through our mission partners around the world. We often pray that people would grow in their faith, that perhaps we pray for our young people when they go to their groups, that they would learn more about Jesus, that they would know what it means to be a Christian. They would learn from God's word. We pray that they would grow and be disciples. How will they become disciples? Unless somebody's there to teach them and to disciple them and to train them up. We can pray for it. We can ask God to be in control, but we have to be responsible. We have to, to provide teachers, provide those who will sacrifice their time and their efforts so they can teach those young people. We have a responsibility as a church to get stuck in, to act. And this is a challenge for us as a church, particularly at the moment. Um, we need more people to be stuck in in some of these groups. Think, for example, of One Way Club on a Thursday, which meets at six o'clock, one Way Club is a wonderful opportunity in the week for children to come to hear about Jesus, to have fun, to come into the church building, and to hear something of the gospel week on week. Lots of the children we get at One Way Club perhaps never come on a Sunday. They're part of families that uh, perhaps would never come yet, never come uh, to church on a Sunday, and yet they come along. We pray that those children, those people would would hear about Jesus, but how will they unless we have more leaders, unless there are people who are willing to serve and get stuck in and do that? And we need more people to do that. Or you think of uh, wonderful ministries that have been happening for years and years, things like Stepping Stones, which is a wonderful opportunity for uh, younger people to be, uh, well, I say younger people, uh, for parents to be coming in or grandparents to be coming in with their children. And it's a great opportunity to welcome them, to be friendly to them, to get alongside them and to share the joys and the challenges of what it means to uh, bring up young children. But we need more people. We need more people to get alongside them, uh, to, uh, to encourage them, to support them. We need somebody to be leading that work. It's great that we pray for stuff. God is absolutely in control, but we also need to do our part as well. Or you may have seen in the notice sheet, um, the notice for more musicians, it's great to pray for our Sunday services. I really encourage you to pray. Pray for me as I preach, please. I'm sure Tom would say the same. Please pray for us as we open up God's word. Please pray that all of our service would be to God's glory. But how is... That's great to pray, but we also need to act, don't we? We also need people who are going to play the instruments. We also need people, for example, to operate the PA system. It's great to have prayers, but we can't just pray... Lord, we pray on Sunday that the PA system would turn on and all the levels would be right. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, God can do that. He spoke the universe into existence with just his words. He is well able to answer that prayer. The reality is we need to do stuff. 
<laughs> we need to get stuck in an act. Now, you may think, look, there are lots of people in this room. There are loads of people here. Surely, surely I haven't got anything to offer. Nothing could be further from the truth. We need everybody to be getting involved. We're going to be thinking a lot about that, particularly next week, about how, how all of us can play our part. No matter even if it's the most small part, you think, we all need to get stuck in. It's all hands on deck. Or you may think, look, I've, I'd love to get involved. I have absolutely no idea what I could be good at or where there are needs. If that's the case, come and chat to me at the end. Come and chat. Send me a message. I'm sure we'd find something uh, for you to get stuck in. Nehemiah prays. It's great for us to pray. We must pray as a church, but also we need to take our responsibility to act, to get stuck in for God's glory. God's people acting together is going to be a major theme of the book of Nehemiah. So we're to pray, we're to act, we're also to think carefully. Now, chapter 1 and chapter 2 start with time references. We said there's about four months between these two chapters. There's a four-month period where Nehemiah is praying. Now, we don't know that he was praying the whole time. Maybe he was. Probably wasn't fasting the whole time. Four months. But he was praying. He was thinking. He was planning on what he was going to do. You can see that in verse 7. When he takes his moment with the king, he says, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates, so they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the, for the gates of the citadel by the temple and the city? That's not a random thing, is it? He hasn't sort of spur of the moment decided on those things. He has thought about that. He's thought about what he needs. He's thought about what the challenges will be, some of the things that he needs to get in place before it happens. He thought about it carefully. He doesn't jump straight in. You can see that again in verses 11 to 18. I won't read all of it, but he goes around the city walls. Do you see that? Verse 16, he comes back. It says, the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, uh, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. He takes time before he sort of speaks and says, right, this is the plan. This is what we're going to do. He takes time to survey the city, to go around, to think about it before he acts. I mean, it's probably a good life lesson generally, isn't it? You know, think before you do something. But I think more specifically, it reminds us in the life of the church, for big things, really big undertakings, we need to think. We need to plan we need to get things in place before we act. We don't want to rush into things. It's right that as Christians we, we use our minds, use our thinking, use the wisdom that God has given us. We have to plan and to think. Now, it's not always the case. If you're, if you're hearing that and you, know, you hear next week, we really need a couple of people to serve tea and coffee after the morning service. The application is not, well, I will consider that for a few weeks before I answer. I really want to think and plan before I sort of throw myself in. For some stuff, we can just say yes. Just get, you can just get stuck in. But for other stuff, perhaps bigger stuff, perhaps building project stuff, it's right that we as a church have taken time to think, to consider, to pray, to plan, to think carefully before we serve God. That's the third thing. We think carefully. Fourthly, we prioritize the good of the body. Nehemiah is in Jerusalem. He's going to get stuck in. We're going to see the people building. We're going to look at that next week, well, two weeks' time. But we see that Nehemiah is not getting stuck in for his own preferences. He's not thinking about what he wants, what he desires, what he's after. He's concerned with the good of the body, the good of others. Verse 10, these opponents of Nehemiah, which we're going to find out more about, it says, they were very, dis very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. Someone has come, they see, for the good of the people, to promote the welfare of the people generally. Verse 12 says a similar thing. Uh, I told... Uh, I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. He's doing it for the people, 
the welfare of the Israelites, the good of the place, the good of the people. It's for their good, not his own. This is not some personal mission of Nehemiah. This is what Nehemiah is doing for the sake of what is good for the people, the welfare of the people. This is not a personal campaign, but what's good for the body. This is, of course, exactly like Jesus, isn't it? Jesus himself did not insist upon his own rights, but gave himself for others, laid down his rights, poured himself out for the good of his people. And Ephesians, uh, Philippians 2 says we are likewise to have that same mindset, not to insist upon our own rights, but to lay them down for the sake of others. We as his people are merely servants. We are vessels, things, people that God will use for the sake of building others up. It's never about us. It's always about God's glory and what is good for others, what is good for the body, what is good to help the church grow, what is good to help the church thrive and mature and develop and be built up. One day, I don't know if this is a happy thought, one day none of us will be in this church. Have you ever thought about that? Um, I hope that encourages you. <laughs> one day none of us will be here in this church. Uh, one day I will not be the pastor of this church. One day somebody else will be here. Um, Robert Murray McShane, who I think died in his 20s, I think end of his 20s, very young, he said this, Changes are coming. Every eye before me shall soon be dim in death. Another pastor shall feed this flock. Another singer lead the psalm. Another flock shall fill this fold. Now, that is not to make you feel bad and depress you this morning, but it is, in some sense, liberating. You may sit on that seat you're sat on, and you may be sat there for 30 years. One day you're not going to be sat there. Somebody else is going to be sat there. We are not building just for now. We hope by God's grace, God's kindness, that unless Jesus returns, that we have a church that's flourishing 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years in the future. That's what we want to be about, building for the sake of the future. What is good for the, for the church to grow, to develop, to thrive in the future? It means that sometimes we don't always, therefore, have to get our way. It's not always that perhaps ministries have to suit our preference, but it's what's good for others. It's what's good for the body. It's what's good to help the church thrive. We have to be honest. Sometimes that's actually pretty painful. We know that. We can be honest about that. Sometimes when perhaps we don't like things done that way, whatever that thing is, whether it's a small thing or a big thing, that is hard. It's okay to find it hard. We can be honest about that. But we can only endure in those moments. We can only put up with that if we've got a bigger picture in mind. If we remember that it's not all about us. We are servants with a much bigger mission. For the sake of what is good for the body, the welfare of the people, in 5, 10, 15, 20, however many years, in God's grace. Nehemiah knew that. Nehemiah embodied that. He took a risk because he was concerned with God's glory. He knew he had to act for the welfare of others, the welfare of the people. And when we do that, by God's grace, all of his grace, when we pray, when we act and step out in faith, when we think and plan what we're going to do, and when we prioritize to act for the sake of what is good for the people, that the church would flourish, we pray that God in his kindness would build us up and help us to flourish as a people. Let's pray that that would be the case. Father, thank you that you are the great and awesome God. You keep your covenant of, of love with those who love you and keep your commandments. You are the God of heaven. You can do all things. We pray that we would depend upon you. We pray that we would act, that we would get stuck in, that we would serve, that we would take our responsibility seriously. We pray, though, that you would be glorified. Help us. Help us as your people to seek the welfare of the people around us, to seek what is good for the building up of this church. But, Father, we know that whatever we do, it is all of your grace. We pray that you, the God of heaven, would give us success. 
that your gracious hand would be upon us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing now, Yet not I, but through Christ in me. The power of God to be at work is Christ working through us. Let's stand and let's sing. <laughs>